It's rare and it's deadly. The Democratic Republic of Congo has suffered its worst ever Ebola outbreak. An experimental vaccine may prove effective against the virus, but what does it take to contain the disease? And how do you reach the people most at risk? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. The Democratic Republic of Congo is struggling to contain the second largest outbreak of Ebola ever. It's killed at least 1,800 people in just one year in the Central African country and has been declared a public health emergency of international concern by the World Health Organization. Four cases were confirmed in Goma, a densely populated city of 2 million close to the Rwandan border. More than 1,300 people have been vaccinated there and no new cases have been reported since the beginning of August. But fears remain the disease could spread. The governor of South Kivu province, which includes Bukavu, has stepped up measures to prevent Ebola entering that city. We launched an Ebola emergency response mechanism in Bukavu under the management of a coordination center. The most important thing at present is to control the flow of people. There's about 1,500 people who travel from Goma to Bukavu. We've set up checkpoints to examine the travelers upon their arrivals and check their body temperatures. If any of them are found with suspicious symptoms, we immediately quarantine him or her to prevent an outbreak in the city. The UN says political unrest and military conflicts in some regions have affected efforts to control Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The problem of Ebola is that the problem of Ebola is very complicated. Fierce armed conflicts and insecurity in some of the affected areas is making the situation quite complex. ADF, an armed group of Ugandan origin, has committed many atrocities in the area, especially in Beni, which makes the response mechanism hard to take effect. All right, let's bring in our guests from Johannesburg, Anthony van Newkirk, Professor of International Relations at Wits School of Governance. In London, Robbie McIntyre, Humanitarian Information Advisor at Save the Children. And in Staffordshire, also in the UK, Mark Eccleston Turner, Lecturer in Global Health Law at Keel University. Welcome to the program. Now, Anthony, let me start with you. You've written that many African nations continue to suffer from weak governance and that weak institutions exacerbated the spread of Ebola. How much more difficult does that make it to effectively combat the spread of Ebola? I wrote about the outbreak of Ebola as it happened in 2014-15 in West Africa, affecting uh, three countries. It was a cross-border emergency situation in West Africa, uh, very difficult to manage, uh, countries emerging from conflict, and without international participation, would not have been able to overcome the crisis, which they did, but it took a long time and many mistakes were made, particularly those of coordination, cooperation, and communication. It seems to me now that uh, with the second, uh, the outbreak now in the DRC, with the potential to spread across borders into Rwanda and neighboring countries, the very same three issues are in need of attention, which is coordination amongst government agencies uh, and countries affected, the second one is cooperation with international agencies without handing over lock, stock and barrel the agenda to control the management of the crisis. And the third one, as important, is communication to explain, first of all, to the local populations what is going on and what the measures are meant to be doing. And then, of course, the international community at large about the kind of support that, that is required. Now, under conditions of state fragility or conflict or armed conflict and war, it makes these things that I'm talking about so much more difficult. And indeed, in the Central uh, African area and in the Kivus, uh, the eastern part of the DRC, I think these uh, conditions are not optimum uh, that will allow for the best kind of coordination and cooperation that is required. And this is going to need the intervention of no less than the president or the presidents of the countries in concern uh, going forward. Robbie, you heard Anthony there just talk about how at the very least 
You need good coordination uh, between uh, ministries, between countries to make sure that the outbreak can be contained. From your vantage point, how much concern is there among health officials that official numbers related to this current outbreak underestimate the true scale? Uh, huge concern, certainly, that it, that it could be worse than those numbers, but also the numbers we do have that, that you mentioned at the top of the show. Um, it's the second biggest outbreak in history. Um, it is getting worse. The number of people affected are, are going up. As you mentioned, um, there have been cases in, in Goma recently. So there is huge concern. Um, and, and for me and for Save the Children uh, as an organization, certainly one of the key things, and I think this was borne out in, in uh, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone in 2014 and 15 as well, is that communication with communities that was being discussed. As well as the conflict, which exacerbates mistrust, there is a huge level of, of worry amongst communities um, that uh, uh, Ebola has been made up um, by NGOs and outside sources as a kind of money-making exercise, um, that it's not real. And it means people don't seek treatment. So a large number of people are, are dying within their homes without having sought treatment, potentially having infected other people. Um, so for us, it's a huge concern that the number of cases is going up. Um, and one of the keys to preventing that from going on is making sure that every affected community is being solidly reached by NGOs, by the Ministry of Health, with very simple messaging that allows them to understand what symptoms to look out for, where to get help in a simple manner that means people do seek out treatment when they need it. Mark, much of the affected region remains inaccessible because of conflict or even remoteness. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, the sporadic violence which, which happens within the, the regions um, has a a significant um, negative impact on the on the actual response. It, it causes vaccination efforts to be suspended. It causes contact tracing efforts to be suspended, both of which are key to bringing this outbreak under control. Anthony, um, in July, uh, Congo's health minister resigned. So how has the response on the ground by DRC's health ministry and other ministries been since that happened? Yeah. So, so, you know, the DRC is a huge country. It's a massive land mass. Um, Kinshasa is very far away from, uh, from uh, eastern DRC. Uh, there are logistical problems. Uh, nevertheless, it's a good sign uh, for us to learn that President uh, Chisekedi has decided to take personal control of the situation. And, and he's put one or two key personnel in place, a new uh, political coordinator, if you want, a minister, of health, but uh, also with access to the budget, and secondly, a, a Ebola virus specialist, an expert who has been drafted to assist the crisis in 2014 and 2015 in West Africa, uh, is also part of the team. So it is. It looks to me as if uh, the new president has swept out the old order uh, that uh, did work of dubious value under the previous president, Kabila and has brought in some resources and technical experts that should allow the government of the DRC to now move forward with some speed. And uh, dare I um, add that in a few days, there will be a SADC, a Southern African Development Community Summit in Tanzania, which is relatively close by. The DRC is a member of, uh, of the SADC. It's a high-level meeting, and I think every opportunity now exists for President uh, Chisekedi to put on the agenda of this regional organization the question of how to better coordinate the, the crisis response and management effort when it comes to Ebola. Robbie, do you believe that the government uh, in DRC is now clearly communicating to the country just how much of a national threat the spread of Ebola is? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I mean, as mentioned, there are huge uh, issues which make this response incredibly difficult, um, not least the security risks. But the government, um, who we cl we work with the Ministry of Health very closely on a lot of the health work that we do, and I, I think they are sending that message of taking it seriously. They, they vaccinated more than 130,000 um, people. Um, we're working very closely with them to reach communities with Ebola prevention messaging, to do surveillance and to do con contact tracing. Um, so I think they are, and those, those recent changes um, that, that you've been talking about, again, show how seriously it's been being taken. I think for us, they do need extra support. Um, 
uh, in, in West Africa in 2014, 2015, that the way that those cases were eventually brought down to zero was, was with a huge international effort as well, with a lot of resources and support being put into the country. And the DRC does need that. It, it, it can't cope with this crisis alone. So we need to, to send more money, more resources to this response um, in order to prevent the outbreak from moving further out of control. Mark, the World Health Organization has said that it has vaccinated over 1,300 people who potentially came into contact with the Ebola virus in Goma. How much will that help contain what many had feared would be a rapid spread in an urban center? So the, the, the hope and the belief is that the, the experimental vaccine, which is currently being um, utilized uh, in the DRC, will be much more effective, uh, will, be, will be very effective. This is a tool which we didn't have available um, to us in the 2014 um, West Africa outbreak, which, which grew exponentially. Uh, now, what we're seeing in the DRC is that the, the, the data coming out is that this vaccine is having a, a positive impact, that, that it is slowing down transmission or at least reducing the number of transmissions which are occurring. Um, without this vaccine in place, um, the, the numbers would be much, much worse, both in terms of number of cases and number of, of, of fatalities. Uh, but we are facing a number of, of key problems in regards to, to the vaccine. Um, chief amongst them is, is vaccine hesitancy and, and mistrust from the community. Now, that isn't a, a problem for medical science, per se. That is a problem for, for community engagement. That is a, a problem for, for the politics of this outbreak. Um, but that is something that, that is uh, the, the success of that, that venture, the, the, the success of the community engagement to make people co feel confident enough to seek treatment, seek the vaccination. That will be key to bringing this outbreak under control. Anthony, I saw you nodding along to um, what Mark was saying when it came to uh, the vaccine campaign. So I wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with him more. And actually, I want to add that um, one of the key lessons that we've learned over the years is community engagement. If communities are distrustful or uncertain or unclear of government's intent or the, the intent of those on the ground who wants to make that intervention, medical teams, tracer teams, security teams, then, uh, then it's not possible to deal with the uh, crisis, with the magnitude of the crisis properly. It is further exacerbated by the fact that in this area that we're talking about now, there's the, uh, the population is quite fluid. There's lots of movement of large numbers of people between city centers uh, as they go to and from work and seek other opportunities, crossing borders, porous borders, in fact, which necessitates the cooperation, the close cooperation of, of uh, neighboring countries at the highest level, uh, because this is a region that is racked with conflict and has a history of, as, you, as our listeners will know, uh, war, genocide, violent conflict, uh, uh, sexual violation as a weapon of war, uh, rebel groups that melt into the uh, environment uh, when attacked. So this makes it a very volatile situation, and political will, I would say, is key to, to making a dent in, uh, in this unfolding tragedy. Robbie, picking up on Anthony's point about uh, border crossings and porous borders in the region, um, earlier this month, Rwanda briefly closed part of its border with DRC. When it comes to the perspective of aid agencies, Border closures are not a good thing when it comes to combating Ebola. Is that correct? I mean, what I've been reading is that they disrupt the work to contain Ebola and to respond to other humanitarian crises. Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that we have advocated, as the WHO has, for, for borders to remain open. And, and the principal and very simple reason for that is that um, when people are crossing border points uh, where they can legally cross border points, people can be screened, which is such an important part of identifying those who, who might be showing the first symptoms of Ebola. If borders are closed, uh, people resort to crossing at illegal border points and places where they are not meant to, uh, where they will not be screened. Um, so we believe borders staying open um, is certainly the safest way forward and is the best way for this outbreak to be combated.
Mark, I saw you nodding as well, so I want to get you to respond to that question too. But also I want to ask you, it was just in July that the WHO declared Ebola in DRC to be a public health emergency of international concern. Why did it take so long? So I'll, I'll touch on the, the border point first, then I, I will go on to talk about the, the, the declaration. I couldn't agree more with, with what Robbie was saying there. Um, one thing we know from previous outbreaks is that whenever borders are closed, whenever um, regressive measures uh, um, such as this are taken by governments, they simply do not work. They are counterproductive. They lead to, as Robbie said, um, individuals to seek. It does not stop p individuals crossing borders. It doesn't stop group um, goods crossing borders. What it does is it forces that those crossings to happen illegally. Now, to tie that into the declaration, when making the declaration of the public health emergency of international concern, WHO uh, and the Director General issued a series of recommendations to governments, one of which was no border closures, no additional trade and travel restrictions on the DRC, because they are regressive and simply do not work. Um, and it is imperative that the international community um, is united in, in calling out measures such as those taken by Rwanda um, when they happen, that, that this breaches the, the recommendations put forward by, the, by the, the, the World Health Organization. It doesn't have a legitimate scientific basis and it is not an acceptable, um, acceptable act. Now, to go on to the declaration um, of the, the public health emergency, why that took so long is, is a question a number of us who are interested in this field are asking ourselves. Um, so myself and some colleagues back in February wrote a paper in The Lancet which outlined the criteria for declaring a public health emergency of international concern and explaining how the criteria were met in the DRC. Following that, there were a number of meetings at WHO of what's called the Emergency Committee. The Emergency Committee recommends to the Director General whether or not they should declare a public health emergency of international concern. At each of these meetings, the Emergency Committee recommended not making such a declaration on grounds which myself and other lawyers um, feel are not based within the, the international health regulations, which is the international treaty we're dealing with here. So the reason it, it took so long is, is, is not clear at this point, and that is a, a question which WHO um, uh, needs to answer in time. The, the important point now is that a declaration has been made and that the international community needs to respond appropriately. Firstly, by not imposing unnecessary trade and travel restrictions on the DRC, but also by ensuring that WHO and the government of the DRC have the tools which they require in order to bring this outbreak under control. That means additional financing, additional resources, and ensuring that the right level of resources are on the ground where they need to be. Anthony, you heard um, what Mark had to say. I mean, since the declaration was made, has the international community been stepping up? And furthermore, the involvement of the international community in a place like DRC, where the disease has been spreading so rapidly, does that necessarily make things better or could it further complicate the situation? Yeah, you know, by way of analogy, um, when, peace, when the peace accord was made for the DRC at the so-called Sun City Talks 2011-2012, uh, uh, I think uh, many years ago, uh, or 2000, 2002, 2003, uh, many years ago, one of the decisions was that the international community ought to get involved in restructuring the security sector and to stabilize civil military relations. What happened was a, an influx uh, or a tsunami of international and NGO participation, uh, all ostensibly trying to restructure the security sector of the DRC. And the DRC has learned a bitter lesson, which is if you open the doors and the international community floods in, you end up with a situation that's arguably worse than before. And so in the case of the management of this crisis, it's really important to say that it cannot be the international community that overrides the sovereignty of the countries affected by this crisis willy-nilly. There must be a form of communication and an agreement between the countries, the governments concerned, and that of the international community, the WHO, and the powerful nations that has the resources and the ability to make a difference. European Union uh, member states, uh, the Americans, the Chinese, and others. Uh, because if that doesn't happen, Political leaders make a calculation 
they view the intervention of the international community as a form of an invasion and taking over or taking control of a very delicate area. And if that political game is not well understood, it is going to put back the management, the international management of this crisis by several weeks, uh, if not months. So I would urge for a mechanism uh, such as friends of the DRC in uh, dealing with the crisis of Ebola to be created as soon as possible. I will not discount the role of the, of the SADC, the SADC, either. It is also a platform, an instrument, a vehicle uh, at the highest level that can be used uh, with some support of the AU and the United Nations Security Council, if you want. Uh, to help coordinate what is necessary to bring this crisis to an end. Robbie, it looked to me like you might have wanted to jump in. Did you want to add to the point that Anthony was making? Uh, I mean, I, I agree, essentially, um, because I don't think that, that there's any um, insistence here that outside support is, is not required. But I would 100% agree that um, coming in with money and resources, but also riding roughshod over... Um, the government and, and local community actors and, and insisting on the way that the response goes forward in corollary with, with that would be a bad thing and would lead to, would lead to further mistrust and would be damaging. So what we are calling for is, is further resources to be made available, for further support to be given, but all in coordination with the Ministry of Health and, and, and with them remaining leading the response uh, rather than riding roughshod, uh, which would lead to, as I say, to, to further mistrust. Save the Children, for example, um, although we are an international NGO, we've worked in, um, in the DRC for many decades, are well embedded within communities, um, but we need further resources for, for reaching more people, both with prevention messaging, but also to, to provide further support to the Ministry of Health with things like surveillance, with things like contact tracing, with things like supporting health facilities with their infection prevention and control procedures. So, so I just completely agree that, um, that doing this carefully um, with, with close coordination is key. Mark, let me ask you this. How much have efforts to contain the virus been hobbled by the militia violence in areas there in DRC? So the, the, the violence which we're seeing, particularly in the, the north of the DRC, has had quite a significant impact on the, the response to, to the outbreak. Uh, whenever violent attacks happen, either on healthcare workers or on uh, healthcare facilities, what we tend to see following uh, in the days following those events is a suspension of vaccination campaigns. So in the following days, no one gets vaccinated. But also, um, specifically, we also see a, a suspension of contact tracing um, efforts um, within the area. Now, contact tracing is, is key to bringing these outbreaks under control. Um, basically, anyone that has had Ebola tracing all of the individuals who they who they have come into contact with checking if they are symptomatic offering them the vaccine tra um, tracking their their symptoms to uh, basically map the spread of the outbreak and try and contain it those efforts also get suspended in the wake of of any armed attack on healthcare facilities and healthcare workers and what we see there is an uptake in in spread of the virus and an uptake in number of cases and sadly an uptake in the the number of deaths uh, which follow so the, the, the security outbreak is, is having a huge impact, not just on, on the international efforts to bring this under control or the efforts of the, the uh, Ministry of Health in the DRC to bring this under control. This is having a huge impact on people in the DRC. They are more likely to contract Ebola are more likely to succumb to its symptoms in the wake of an armed attack within their area. This has a huge impact on the, on the control efforts and on the communities um, that Ebola is affecting. All right, well, we uh, have run out of time, so we're going to have to end it there. Thanks so much to all our guests, Anthony Van Newkirk, Robbie McIntyre, and uh, Mark Eccleston-Turner. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program any, again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.